Hello friends, my name is Marines and these are the 12 books that I read last month. I started off strong with Velvet Was the Night by Sylvia Marina Garcia. Of course there are books by Marina Garcia that I like better than others but I have yet to be like truly disappointed with anything that I've read by her and this was no exception. This is a noir mystery set in the 1970s in Mexico City and we follow a character named Maite who is a secretary who is like a little bit unsatisfied with her life and she's got a next door neighbor who is an art student who is beautiful and seems to live this life of intrigue and her next door neighbor asks her to take care of her cat and then just never comes back. So it becomes a missing persons mystery and we meet other people who are also interested in finding this woman but all for self-interested reasons. As I said, I did enjoy this. I would say that it is a slower paced and character driven sort of mystery and it is very heavy in the atmosphere and like the smokiness of a noir. So I feel like if that sort of like pacing and haziness isn't for you generally, it will not be for you here. I also find that Moreno Garcia's writing is very descriptive but in ways that I think are very specific to each of her books or that capture different senses or imagery. In Signal to Noise it was music. In Gods of Jade and Shadow it was very much color and in Velvet Was a Night the description really is more like a sort of like wordiness in terms of the internal monologues that we're getting from the main characters and we focus a lot on like the details of what they're thinking and feeling and all of the directions that that goes. Additionally, this is a book that is filled with characters who, for lack of a better word, are unlikable. As I said, there there is a missing persons mystery at the heart of this, but the reason that everybody is like interested in finding this woman, like none of it is about this woman. <laughs> Despite all that, I ultimately found Maite and Elvis to be two really interesting characters. I felt like I couldn't look away from them and a lot of what they were feeling, their heartache and the situations that they found themselves in, I found incredibly easy to connect to and sort of empathize with. I gave this four out of five stars. The nonfiction book club pick for January was On Immunity and Inoculation by Eula Biss. Nonfiction book club is a book club that picks a nonfiction book based in science and discusses it every month. It is run by my two very good friends, Nicole and Deboki. So I encourage you guys to check it out. It encourages me to read nonfiction, more nonfiction, and also their discussions are always really thoughtful and help me understand what I'm reading even better. This book is a book that was published in 2014, so pre-COVID pandemic. Pandemic, but she wrote it around the time of H1N1 and it is basically going through like her own journey of like vaccine hesitancy when her son was born. So she started asking questions about whether or not she should vaccinate her son for H1N1 and that led down this road of more questions about vaccinations in general. And she talks not only about her personal experience, but she pulls in social, historical, and scientific context to vaccination as a whole. And Eulabis is a poet and and you can very much tell in the way that she writes this that she has a beautiful command of language. So I thought it was a very interesting lens. I thought it was a really interesting snapshot of like pre-COVID talk about pandemics and vaccination because like nothing has changed. <laughs> I know we keep saying unprecedented times and I understand why the scale of this makes it unprecedented, but it is wild to me how the same speaking points that she was talking about in 2014 are just like lather, rinse, repeat in, in now times. I appreciated this because even when it frustrated me, <laughs> it was frustration coming from a point of like I have less like patience and probably compassion for anti-vax like rhetoric than you Labis does and she approaches the topic and she discusses it with that patience and understanding and like evenness so it's really great for her book it just frustrated me <laughs> because of me but it was really readable and I am glad that I ultimately read it and it is one that if I had like someone near me who was on that line of vaccine hesitancy and it was coming from a place of trying to do right by a child or family this is something that I would recommend because I feel like it is a work that can penetrate and really make the argument clearly and thoughtfully I ended up giving this four or 4.5 out of five stars for the book club that I do with my friends locally with Tina Jess and Carol if any of you guys have met them previously at events so we just pick books <laughs> we try to do it monthly but we're so bad about this we're 
We're trying to be pretty consistent this year. We primarily read romances and our January book was stalked by the Kraken. This is a sci-fi monster romance in which a Kraken finds his mate, like sees her and, and knows that this person is his mate. And that woman is a witch who runs a magical bathhouse and is a matchmaker. But she recently mismatched herself and it's knocked her confidence in her own powers and abilities down. This was very different from what I was expecting purely based on the title Stalked by the Kraken. It is a lot softer and cozier of a romance than I was expecting, and Gideon the Kraken is a lot softer and more romantic of a character than I was expecting. It really is like a cozy monster romance. I appreciated what the author was attempting to do in terms of making this a fully fleshed out story and including other bits of plot. There is something mysterious going on in the bathhouse. We follow Gideon in his job and what he's dealing with there. But as much as I appreciated the attempt, I also found that I didn't care about those other plots. I didn't feel like they were seamlessly integrated or fully fleshed out. And also it gave the story an air of like taking itself a little too seriously. The plot details were meh. The character dynamic was really interesting and sweet and it bypassed a number of tropes that it could have easily fallen into. So overall I gave this three out of five stars. The book we read for House Salt book club for January was These Violent Delights by Chloe Gong. This is a YA fantasy retelling of Romeo and Juliet set in 1920 Shanghai in which two rival gangs basically run the city. The heirs to those gangs, Juliet and Roma, were once in love but had a huge falling out and now they are back in Shanghai together and they have to put aside their differences and work together because something mysterious is happening in the city and it's killing a lot of people on both sides. This was incredibly disappointing and would have been a definite DNF for me had it not been for book club and for me like really pushing myself through to get it done. I found this so tedious and it failed on like all fronts, on all advertised fronts. So this is YA. And while the story itself definitely had YA tendencies, I don't actually get the point of pitching this as YA and having our characters be 19. I know the author was young when she wrote it, but this felt to me like it could have been aged up just a little bit and been the adult fantasy that it wanted to be. Even though I use fantasy lightly because this is also not really a fantasy. It had one fantastical element that then at the end like leans sci-fi and so the whole decision to include that one element is so weird to me and feels so out of place in this and it made me upset that this is marketed as a fantasy. And then you have the Romeo and Juliet aspect of it and <laughs> no. The idea of calling this a retelling and being Romeo and Juliet, but having the bulk of their relationship of their falling in love happen in a past that we don't get to see is wild to me. And even if you just want to capture the main feelings of Romeo and Juliet, that is a lot of longing and angstiness. And all of that is missing here because again, the bulk of all of that happens off screen in the past and it is just referenced over and over again in this book. And all of those very weak elements are tied together by mediocre writing. This went on for too long, first of all. There is absolutely no reason that this should have been dragged out for as long as it was. I know I'm fond of saying this, but truly a hundred pages could have been cut out of this and it would have been such a better book for it. And the main issue is how much we are told and not shown. She went off on tangents. There were too many details where we didn't need them and not enough information where we did need them. And the plot is so thin and so stretched out that by the time you get to the end and it is a very obvious end, it is so unsatisfying. After I finished reading this, I said it wasn't as bad as like my one star reads. And I feel like that is true in a certain way, but also my enjoyment of this and the longer that I've sat with it, I can really see how truly unenjoyable that I found this. So I rated this two stars like when on the live show and I think on Goodreads, uh, maybe 1.5 stars. I just, this, this needed a lot more work. It needed more editing. It needed a tighter concept. It felt a little half-baked and underdone and like I said a true disappointment. Next I read Ain't Burned All the Bright by Jason Reynolds and Jason Griffin and this was sent to me by Simon Teen and essentially Jason Reynolds wrote three long sentences and sent it over to the artist Jason Griffin and said 
interpret this as you will. Break up the words any way you want, put the images the way that you want, and they turned it into this book. The closest comparison that came to mind as I was reading was the boy, the horse, the mole, and the fox. <laughs> That was completely wrong. The boy, the mole, the fox, and the horse. It is the same sort of thing where it is high concept, very visual, and with like a sparse story in between. And the words here and the imagery is all about breath. So it came from Griffin telling Reynolds that art was his oxygen mass in sort of these times. And Reynolds took that and ran with it. And so he first ties it to breathing and I can't breathe and sort of being involved in this constant news cycle of violence against black people in the US and then he ties it to breathing in terms of COVID-19 and the pandemic and everything we've been living through for the last couple of years and then the last section really is about like oxygen mask and like breathing things that sustain you. I thought in general that this was pretty spectacular to look at. I enjoyed the art style. It had a notebook style like sketching journal sort of feel to it which I really appreciated and basically when I went through this I went through once quickly to just read the words because I wanted to read them and then I went back through and took a little bit more time to appreciate the art. I gave this four out of five stars. I think it did what it set out to do very effectively. I would recommend this to people who enjoy like graphic novels and enjoy a more visual storytelling style. I also think that this would be great to read along with younger readers because it approaches a number of these topics very simply and very at their level. Next I read my favorite book book of last month and that is The Past is Red by Catherine M. Valenti. You guys probably know by now that this is one of my favorite authors ever and I was talking about her over on my TikTok and I realized that I hadn't like kept up with her newer releases so I got an audiobook copy of The Past is Red. I loved it so much I bought a physical copy and essentially this is a post-apocalyptic story in which what ended the world was a climate disaster. The first part of this is a short story that was featured in an anthology about climate disaster stories and Catherine M. Valenti took that and then added the second portion to put together this little novella and I would describe this as a slice of life post-apocalyptic story and it is very focused on Tetley's point of view and her experiences. The thing that I loved the absolute most about this was Tetley's voice and who she is as a character sort of in this grim world. The entire earth is covered by water and what is currently the Great Pacific Garbage Patch has grown exponentially and the only remaining humans on the world are living on this garbage patch. It is so big that they've managed to carve out like sections and neighborhoods that are basically themed after the sort of garbage that exists there, whether that's candles or batteries or old pill bottles. Tetley is a social pariah in her community because of something that she does that we find out about in the book and so she is exposed to a lot of abuse from her community but she is an optimistic person not in an unrealistic way she still got some grittiness to her and she is very aware of like the situations in the world that she lives in but she's still optimistic and hopeful and her entire point of view is like this is the best world because this is the world that we have this is the reality that we are living in and I just found that combination of characteristics and traits in this setting absolutely engrossing. I gave this five out of five stars and the final six books I read is a little bit embarrassing because I have been reading the series for years and years and years and I was like this is it this is this is the time that I finish it. However, I only had time in January to reread the ones that I had already read. <laughs> so <laughs> some might think I did that on purpose. I didn't. I just like was reading along and then it was like, oop, the end of January and I had only reread the six Kate Daniels books that I have already read. I'm determined to finish this series in February. I have books seven, eight, nine, and 10 left. I'm going to do it. I caught up with Mercy Thompson before I finished Kate Daniels and I started reading this one first. It is to a point now that I have reread these enough that they're like a comfort series for me. And I feel like I can still be pretty objective about like its weaker points, particularly a tendency to have repetitive writing, especially when it comes to certain elements of the world building. 
the authors rely pretty heavily on just like defining everything in the moment and reminding us a lot about character dynamics and powers and abilities and things like that. But the like strengths of this to me are the characters and the dynamics between the characters and the found family that gets put together and the way that each book feels really satisfying, like a, a single contained mystery murder of the week sort of thing in book format. I am really enjoying these. The sixth book, Magic Rises, I, part of the reason I stopped is because I really didn't like this one when I read it. And then going back and rereading it, I realized that it's not as bad as it lives in my memory. I was just extremely frustrated by like the core thing that causes conflict in this and then how easily it's resolved at the end. And the fact that that core conflict thing made Kate and Curran both act out of character in a way that was frustrating to me, all of that holds, but I don't think it is as bad as I was like remembering. So I'm going to, like I said, just keep going, go straight into book seven <laughs> and finish this off. But overall, this is a series that I think is greater than the sum of its parts. Each individual book is usually like three, 3.5 or four stars for me. But overall, the series so far is like four, four and a half stars for me. Okay, and also what's making me appreciate these even more is that I am currently reading Crescent City. <laughs> I said I was gonna read this like a year ago, made a whole video about like hate reading and why do I hate reading? I'm gonna read this book and then I didn't. But I'm actually recapping this kind of like I do Snark Squad recaps, but on TikTok. So I've got little videos where I recap each chapter. It's been a lot of fun so far. It's very interesting to figure out if like the format of my recapping fits on TikTok, especially with like the time constraint of each video and the fact that there isn't really a good way to like tie videos together. But anyways, uh, so I'm reading this and it is an urban fantasy that relies a ton on info dumping. And the comparison is, I don't know if it's, I was gonna say it's probably not fair, but why not? The comparison is fair. This is so bad in the way that it is laying out the world and the magic and the character dynamics that it has made me appreciate the last urban fantasy that I read, this, so much more. Even for the repetition in this, it is like miles better, miles better than anything that is happening in Crescent City. So lots of love for Kate Daniels this month. <laughs> and that's it. And I usually don't really deal in TBRs because I feel like it's a lot of commitment for me, a mood reader, but I did put together like a list of books that are on my radar and I put that up on TikTok. So I figured I would share with you guys what those books are. The House Salt book for February is Ice Planet Barbarians by Ruby Dixon, which I've already read, but I kind of wanted to read that one, reread that one and see if I could move on in the series because I've heard from so many people that it gets better after book one and I was personally underwhelmed by book one so I've started rereading that one already since we are pretty well into February right now and we'll see how far I get with that. I have two books from authors that I love so first Echo Brown released a new book called The Chosen One and it is in that same style as Black Girl Unlimited where it is part autobiographical part magical realism and then I'm reading Catherine and Valenti's most recent recent release, Comfort Me With Apples. I have a hold on that at the library, so if it comes through on time, then I will read that in February. For my romance book club, we are reading The Insiders by Tajan. For nonfiction book club, they are reading Culture Warlords by Talia Lavin. And then from Libro FM's ALC program for February, I got Like a Sister by Kelly Garrett, and I've already started listening to that. And then as I mentioned, I am reading House of Earth and Blood. So those are a few of my plans. We'll see how well I stick to them. I will end this by saying that I've had such a time like thinking about this channel, <laughs> especially since I've been using like my free creative time to post over on TikTok, like I've said a billion times on this. I, and I think I'm doing that because of the instant gratification of making something, posting it on TikTok and actually seeing people engaging with it and my channel growing and like all of that stuff that makes having a community really exciting. And on YouTube, and I know part of it is because I have been inconsistent, I post Post and I lose subscribers and it's just so frustrating and it is not very easy to sort of organically find people and my channel has been plateaued for years and years whereas I've been on TikTok for less than a year and I have two and a half times the following than I do here on YouTube where I've been 
for years. All of that can be a little bit discouraging, but I really do love the space and I really do love the format of being able to talk a little bit more at length on my feelings and have discussions. This is a ton more work, which is the other thing is that I end up not doing it for a while and like my task anxiety around this gets really bad and I start like building it up in my head. And usually if I just sit down and do it, I'm like, oh, that wasn't that bad. And then I edit, I'm like, this is not that bad. Uh, as bad as I was kind of like fearing, but they're all hurdles that I have to kind of get over before I sit down and make a video. I am determined, however, to at least do my monthly wrap ups with a few special things in between. So yeah, thank you for being here. Thank you for watching this and for interacting and for letting me know that you guys are out there appreciating my content. If you have read or would like to read any of the books that I've mentioned today, let's chat down about it in the comments. Thank you so much for watching this video and I will see you guys soon. Our January book was Stalked by the Kraken by Puppy. <laughs> hey, Papa. Hey, Puppy.